Hey everyone, before we take off today, allow me a moment to talk about the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. Just like when flying through Kingdom Hearts Outer Space, when you're exploring the vast cosmos that is the internet, you should consider employing some degree of protection during your travels. In the former case, you might slap a shield gummy on your ship, and in the latter, you'd want to take a look at virtual private networks, which NordVPN specializes in. VPNs protect your data from hackers, government agencies, and greedy people in the shadows trying to make a quick buck off of your preferences and habits that can be extrapolated from said data. Corporations these days have it so easy. Back when I was growing up, you had to get a degree in replica science and fight with a big ice shield if you wanted to get your hands on precious data. In addition, NordVPN can allow you to access content that's restricted in certain countries or territories. You want to watch Netflix or Hulu but can't because of some stupid lines on a map? Well, to that, NordVPN says, Lines be gone. You've lived here your entire life. Now enjoy your binge of 34 seasons of Survivor. So, to get better protected and better armed to safely partake in everything this big wide web has to offer, let me chart your course for you. Head on over to nordvpn.com slash regularpat or use the code regularpat to get a two-year plan plus a bonus gift with, what else, a hearty discount. What's your favorite thing about Kingdom Hearts? The combat? The story? The blending of Disney and Square Enix? The gummy ship stuff? If you answer D, congratulations, you're a liar or an internet contrarian for sport. I mean, far be it from me to pick on people with peculiar tastes, I'm the guy who has no problem with anything happening on screen right now, and I gladly believe anyone who says they enjoy flying around in Kingdom Hearts space in any given game, I just can't suspend enough disbelief to peacefully respect an opinion that it's the best part of any given entry. Like, I guess I could respect it eventually, but not peacefully. There'll be name-calling for some reason. I'll die on this asteroid. I've been thinking a lot about gummy travel lately, maybe because I subconsciously want to put out a video that gets less views. I'm just a sucker for punishment in that way, I guess. But I want to discuss it because I feel like most people, myself included, kind of brush it off as something that's just part of the games. A necessary evil, maybe. Well, I guess it's not really necessary at all if you ask birth by sleep. But today I'd like to take a somewhat deepish dive into interstellar travel as portrayed by Kingdom Hearts. Why do we have it? What good and bad does it do? And what does each iteration of it say in relation to its respective game? It's a regular pat road trip across the cosmos, so buckle up. Er, I mean, do it, do what you want, I guess. There's, there's no law out here, uh, just space pirates and these little floating panel things, so. We've got this awesome rocket! Wait till you see it! I'll start out with the point in the positive column for this chewy mode of transport. It's conceptually an amazing addition to the first game. I've talked at length about how Kingdom Hearts 1 is, from my perspective, something of a masterclass in imparting mystique and establishing a sense of scale for the universe of the series. We'll talk about execution and the actual practice, but as far as the idea goes on paper, it's phenomenal. This is not to say that space travel in and of itself is an exceptionally unique or even exciting concept at this point in video game history. Hell, some of the earliest games were set in the Big Empty, probably because it was pretty easy to represent. I can draw a pretty mean outer space just using MS Paint. But in a game that is definitively not at its core about space travel, where it probably wouldn't be in the first 10 or 15 bullet points about the game that you might list off when describing it, gummy travel is perfect for what Cage one is setting out to do. In a game that starts off by plopping you into this ragtag effort to construct a simple raft for ocean travel, there's basically no better way to up the ante and raise the stakes than to quickly promote you from first mate of the high wind, since you lost the race, to captain of the poop fart. And just thinking about how Kingdom Hearts, both of the first entry and the entire series, is set up, I guess this way of doing things is almost obvious. How else do you visually represent and justify traveling between Disney properties while also making it something the player can interact with? Truth be told, we and the games refer to the sites of these properties as worlds, but a more honest description is probably dimensions, considering they all kind of operate on their own rules and some just blatantly contradict the existence of others. But when Sora, Riku, and Kairi talked about other worlds in the tutorial, I distinctly remember thinking, even at age 6, how how the exact fuck do you expect to cross over into another world on a piece of wood? Unless the three of them are flat earthers, I was fairly certain they need to divert their attention from picking mushrooms and focus on getting engineering degrees. So apart from like some sort of boring machine that teleports the party from one dimension world to the next, space travel has always felt like the best and most natural way to progress through the game. On top of that, it adds some degree of connective tissue to a universe made up of worlds that are, by design, distinctly unconnected. And as I mentioned, this all goes a long way in just making the game world feel grand and adventurous. In this iteration, it's really just a Super Mario Bros. 3 world map that makes you play a minigame if you want to move Mario from level 1 to level 2. But by styling it all around space travel and showing the player that there actually is some physical space between these locations, you can't help but feel like you're really voyaging into parts unknown each time you move your cursor over mysterious planet icon and press X. 
or whatever button you can play this game on whatever you want nowadays. If Darkseid or the giant apocalypse ball on Destiny Islands didn't make you feel small, maybe the vast cosmic ocean will have you feeling like an underdog sending out on an odyssey. Before moving on to the actual act of playing through these gummy segments, I want to highlight how KH1, even 19 years later, still has the others beat when it comes to that charismatic, mysterious atmosphere, and this seeps into even the gummy stuff. For the life of me, I don't know why the sequels didn't follow the first game's lead and stick to this little detail I just mentioned. And I know it's small and you might think I'm making too much out of it, but hear me out on this. There's literally nothing to lose and everything to gain by representing an unvisited world with this question mark planet. Like, in reality, a fan of the series who limits themselves to only skimming the absolute surface of pre-release materials is probably still gonna know everything about Cage 3 before actually seeing it, but still. If you have the option to make something in your game feel like an event, then why wouldn't you? Why rob the player of the anticipation and the fun of setting course to an unexplored world and wondering the whole drive what they're going to pull up on? It's always seemed like such a missed opportunity to have the world icons in 2 and 3 just floating there, fully visible before actually flying to them, allowing the player to know exactly where they're going. It would make sense if you were returning to every world from the first game, but you're not. You leave Hollow Bastion in Cage 2 and you don't see shadowy silhouettes of uncharted planets. You see a building with a Chinese dragon and a castle with a rose and go, oh, so Mulan and Beauty and the Beast world. I can't believe I'm quoting Zaldan of all characters, but where's the fun in this? I can only imagine how cool it would have been to be playing through Cage 2 blind, selecting a new world that's just a big obscured blob, fighting through the gummy route, and then seeing Pride Goddamn Rock slowly creep into view. You got to have that exact experience in Cage 1 on 10 separate occasions, and one of those includes a fucking whale just showing up and eating you. Again, I know this might air more on the side of nitpick than critique, but why not just inject a little bit of mystery into the process when it's not only incredibly easy to do, but something that you've done in the past? In fact, they even take this half measure in two to hide the worlds at some points, but it's just that, a half measure. They should always have this protective, misty shield around them until the moment you finish the gummy route that precedes it. It seems so obvious to me, but it's a fumble that was repeated in 3. In an alternate world line where I have my way and somehow managed to watch zero KH3 trailers and avoid all information about the game, I flew to Toybox and my eyeballs fell out of my face and onto the floor. In short, why won't Square Enix blind me and cover my eyeballs in lint and hair? I'm, I'm begging for it. That extended aside brings me to what's really the germ of this video, something that might seem fairly obvious but was also something I never explicitly thought about until recently. But I think each game's gummy segments are like, super representative of what it's like to play the rest of the respective game. Like, again, maybe it's not really shocking that a game's general design philosophy manages to prevail in even its less prominently featured areas. But I also don't think the gummy segments being fairly synonymous with the traditional gameplay was like, some kind of intentional maneuver. I'll try to justify my take on this as best as I can, and I don't expect everyone to agree since it'll involve getting into my opinion on how the bulk of each game succeeds or fails in the rest of its areas. But I guess this type of risk versus reward game I play with you all is like, an adrenaline peak for me at this point, so let's proceed with that justification. Look who's on top of the game! I think talking about either one or two here is best done as a compare and contrast exercise since they're more like each other than either of them are like three, but still pretty different. My thoughts here are going to be pretty derivative of my thoughts on world design and exploration in both games, discussed at length in each game's world ranking project, the room rankings, and the evolution of motion essay. But in short, I tend to like it a lot in KH1, and tend to like almost none of it in KH2. Now, this opinion isn't perfectly mirrored when talking about the gummy stuff, because frankly, I don't really care about what we get in either game, but there are elements present in both games' worlds that reverberate into the gummy portions. Even I'll concede that when compared to the silky smooth and speedy movements in the game's successors, the gummy sections in KH1 definitely definitely echo the rough-around-the-edges air that the game proper carries about. But, and don't shoot me with either cannons or lasers when I say this, I still find myself having a more pleasant experience with the gummy outings in 1 over 2. Looks like I've got a lot of explaining to do. Mind you, it's not like a vast disparity between the two, and ideally I'd still like to play neither. If I could frame this in the most pretentious sounding way possible, I'd say that in KH1 segments you're interacting with the world, and in 2's the world is interacting with you. Does that make any sense? I always felt like I had a lot more agency and that I could enact more of my own free will in a KH1 gummy route than in a KH2 one. Conceptually, they're not that different. After blasting off, the game pushes you along from point A to B. If your ship were indestructible, the game would play itself in getting you to your destination, which can't be set for three, so that's why I think these first two iterations are more similar than different. I guess on rails would be the terminology you'd use for that. I don't really play any games that resemble what's happening in any of the gummy segments, so forgive my ignorance there. Regardless, on rails is 
pretty much an exaggeration of exactly how I feel about Cage 2 proper on most occasions. It's very flashy, it's action-packed, it's a spectacle, but there's just some sort of hollowness to it for me. Whether my feet are on the ground or pressed against the gummy pedals, it doesn't ever really feel like I'm engaging with an environment that acknowledges Sora or the ship as a tangible entity. I'm just passing through as the game directs me through a series of hallways or sweeping gummy vistas until I reach my destination. There's really dazzling stuff happening and I'm hitting the hell out of the attack button all the while, but it's always felt like more style than substance for me. And I don't want to downplay how much more visually interesting and impressive the Cage 2 routes are when compared to their predecessors, because they so obviously win in that comparison. But I still can't help but be bored in spite of the visual flair and the constant barrage of enemies. Even though both games' routes funnel you down a set path, I always felt more grateful that one at least afforded me the chance to more concretely interact with what's in my way. Maybe my feelings there are mostly impacted by the frequency of the non-heartless obstacles, which, again, are not like visual marvels or super interesting, but it's like, oh, neat, it matters how I choose to move the control stick here and not just for the sake of blasting enemies. Just like in the main game, there's something of a structured series of objects and obstacles to engage with. You have some degree of choice and agency here, as small as it may be. I mean, this is just my opinion, but to rephrase a previous statement, it feels like I'm approaching the world that lies ahead of me in one, whereas the world is rushing to meet me in two. But the world in that sentence is kind of the operative phrase there. In one, that means a sequence of static and moving obstacles in addition to formations of enemy ships. In two, it means a shit ton of enemies with a backdrop that's painted a different color depending on what world you're going to. I want to make it clear again that this is going to come down to preference and that I don't think anyone's wrong for disagreeing with me. I'm mostly just trying to communicate why I think I find one style more appealing than two's. I certainly see the value and understand the satisfaction in just mowing down bad guy ships as the game pulls you through these funky settings. I just think, much like in the traditional KH1 gameplay, there is more weight to how things feel when you hit or shoot them, and while it's much slower and less flashy, there's more consequence to how you choose to actually go about moving. For me, it comes down to feeling like I'm actually traveling somewhere in KH1, whereas in 2, it's kind of like one of those theme park rides where you're experiencing this illusion of movement, but it's mainly just your seat rocking back and forth a bit as a big screen in front of you simulates you moving through a space. Which, again, again, is kind of reminiscent of how I feel about both games during their traditional gameplay. I think you can chalk the bulk of this sensation up to the nature of the camera in two segments. Something about the fast-paced and frantic nature and constantly changing camera angles gets in the way of conveying a more genuine feeling of traveling from point A to B. That all being said, I want to give Cage 2 props for introducing big boss-like enemy ships, which is definitely a natural evolution of the stuff thrown at you in 1. I'm especially a fan of this big wheel guy being a recurring enemy in two routes, it's cool to have a little bit of continuity there. On that note, I also think it's cool that the routes are like paired up into duos with similar names and theming. For what it's worth, the sequences are obviously more distinct and memorable than their predecessors despite my not having as much fun playing through them. The gold crown here easily goes to the last mission before your final visit to Twilight Town. It's essentially the gummy version of you storming the actual castle in the world that never was, complete with nobody-inspired architecture and some actual environmental hazards, namely these little panel things that require you to shoot the button before colliding with them to open it up in time. Throwing in small things like this throughout the rest of the game's routes probably would have had me singing its praises a bit more often. I will say, even though I mentioned how Cage 2's gummy segments are more visually interesting and memorable, I wish they all displayed the same degree of theming and cohesiveness that Assault of the Dreadnought does with the world it never was. Obviously, Cage 1 made no real effort to theme the routes around its corresponding worlds, but given that Cage 2 was willing to go the extra mile with the visuals here, it definitely feels like a missed opportunity to not have the routes more distinctly tie into the atmosphere of its world. It would kind of make sense that the space radiating from each world would be influenced by that world's environment and architecture. I always thought it was especially baffling that we have a literal giant pirate ship Gummy Heartless and it's nowhere near the route to Port Royal. You get a little bit more cohesion in the Atlantica and Agrabah routes, but I almost have to wonder if this is an accident considering how inconsistent the theming is for the rest of the routes. Regardless, I also can't argue with getting five additional music tracks to accompany these new gummy routes in two. That's not to speak less of how KH1's gummy music is treated either, which evolves from the peaceful precious stars in the sky into Blast Away 1 and then 2 and 3. The tracks gradually get busier and culminate in the epic, almost dark reprise in Blast Away 3, and this evolution is accompanied by the backgrounds changing from light blues to bright reds to jet blacks and dark purples. It really imparts this feeling of getting physically closer and closer to the end game as time goes on. While we're talking about some of the more ancillary components from both experiences, I will say that not having the warp gummy from the get-go in KH1 is definitely hot garbage. For me, this is an instance of immersion not being as important as anti-frustration features. At a point, I'm less concerned about the game feeling like a bona fide adventure and more concerned about being bored out of my skull when playing a section that I played an hour ago, but this time backwards. The moment when Sid decides to install the warp 
Morph Gummy is a serotonin peak for the game, despite my suspicions that he also downloaded a U2 album to the Gummy Ship while he was at it. I should note that after unlocking the Warp ability outside of doing missions, there's never really a reason to manually fly to a world you've already unlocked from one of its neighbors, but I think the simple fact that there is this fixed route that can be experienced through flying from A to B or B to A also helps in conveying a sense of actual travel and movement throughout the universe of the game. I think that sense is damaged in the sequel, since you never really fly from places, only to them. Since you start each mission from a free roamy world map, and each mission spits you back out into it, I think this also builds up my perception of the Cage 2 routes feeling less like travelable space roads and more like cinematic roadblocks. I cannot stress enough that coming face to face with a gummy segment in either game evokes a sigh from me, with the only difference being that in 2, the sigh is just slightly longer and louder. I'll be fine if I never have to play any of them again. But in summation, when comparing these first two outings, Cage 2s are definitely more impressive set pieces and are overall more fun to look at, but I have to give the edge to 1 for its steady sense of progression, whether it's that musical and visual transformation throughout the game, or the simple act of gradually unveiling the world map from left to right. We get the picture. At the end of the day though, I think the gummy segments in both 1 and 2 were born of limitation, whereas 3s are, in my eyes, what these sequences would have always looked like if it were both possible and pretty 19 years ago. Full disclosure, I've got this iteration of gummy travel beating the first two by light years, and according to a poll of over 5,500 viewers, 57% of you seem to agree. For me, Cage 3s is nearly a perfect blend of everything good about both versions that preceded it, and in some cases it improves on some areas. I will once again state that this is not necessarily something I ever found or find myself looking looking forward to, but it doesn't evoke that elongated sigh for me. And the main reason why that is, I think, is because you really don't have to engage with it all that much if you don't want to. Just like in the previous games, you need to manually fly to new worlds in order to unlock fast travel between them, but this trip is relatively quick and painless if you make use of those blue accelerant tubes scattered around the cosmos. If you want to shoot stuff or do missions, that's entirely up to you, save for the occasional boss ship that shows up when arriving at a world or the big fortress thing in the Eclipse area, it's basically all optional. And given the open world nature of things on this go around, it kind of makes sense that you're very very rarely forced to fight enemy ships or take specific routes, because space is, like, really fucking big. If there's shit in the way, you can just go around said shit. So in this way, it's really my ideal synthesis of everything I've appreciated throughout each version of Gummy Travel. I found the other ones boring for sure, but at least Cage 2's Gummy Combat was boring and fast, and Cage 3 preserves that fast-paced style if you do want to bother with it. At the same time, 3 brings back 1's feeling of actual travel and in a far more believable and immersive way. As I said at the top of this section, this feels like what gummy travel was always supposed to look like. Not dinky little obstacle courses or a constant bombardment of arcade shooting, but like space with artistic and creative liberties. I think it most genuinely conveys that reality of the separation between the worlds and the feeling that you're actually moving about a physical space when traveling from A to B. I'm not saying it controls like a dream or that it can't be improved at all as far as the actual navigating or that I even really want or need to see it again, but if the developers decide that Cage 4 needs to have gummy travel too, I'm pointing to this game as the one to emulate. This game even addressed my theming nitpick about both games before it and improved on that. Like you can see icy crystalline spires near Arendelle, space coral around the Caribbean, twisty dead trees around the Kingdom of Covid, and big metallic structures near San Francisco and Monstropolis. All this to say, given that the Cage 3 segments put a lot more emphasis on world building and design on top of exhibiting a bit more charm, I also found that these segments are reflective of my feelings toward Cage 3 on the whole. I think there are some parallels that are especially evident in the general world design philosophy both in space and on land. Cage 3 obviously has some of the biggest rooms and environments in the series, ranging from contained but still spacious areas like Galaxy Toys, or entire worlds that are essentially an open-world-esque free-for-all like San Francisco or the Caribbean. And while Cage 2 had rooms that may have felt spacious, there was never a whole lot to do in any of them outside of walking to the next one with very little choice in your path and fighting any mobs that got in your way, not unlike its gummy segments. Now, I'm on the record as still preferring Cage 1's world design over both 2 and 3's, but at least in 3 there was some semblance of attention and care given to the prospect of interacting with the environments, having interconnected spaces, and implementing more layered elements into its rooms. It's often big and open, but you've got options and stuff to do, and that's not too unlike the game's gummy areas, which feature these sections with cannons or caves or other types of hazards and obstacles. Another aspect where Three's gummy stuff outshines the other games is integration with the core gameplay. There was a tiny bit of this in one, but the funnel is positioned the wrong way, at least if you ask me. You could buy stuff at Sid's shop and find gummy blocks scattered around the worlds in chests, but if you already don't care about the gummy stuff, which a lot of players definitely don't, this is all basically dead air. KH3 flips the funnel and instead has its gummy segments provide you items of value for your time spent in places with stricter gravity, namely materials that aid you in leveling up your keyblades. Sure, this mostly amounts to just shooting 
the shit out of asteroids, which feels great as an aside, but it's better than these two components of the game being completely independent of each other. The gummy ship portions of 3 acknowledge that there is a whole other game, like 59 out of $60 worth of game, that you're going to be coming and going from, and it gives you stuff to use during your time spent there. In addition to all that great stuff, KH3's portions have these bells and whistles in the way of stuff like constellations and treasure spheres. More optional stuff, but stuff that doesn't just boil down to space-based combat. It's inoffensive, and it's still not a highlight of the game, but it's just a why-not sort of accessory for me. Stuff like constellations based on Final Fantasy creatures that unlock blueprints based on them. Plus, these treasure spheres remind me of Treasure Planet, so KH3 won before the script was even started. Needless to say, this was all entirely subjective, and KH3's way of doing things for both parts of the game just places more emphasis on things I find valuable in a video game. I should note, I didn't really cover stuff like each game's editors or actual missions, mostly because I don't care as much about them and only experience the totality of the latter, like one time each for platinum trophy purposes. I will say, I've always had a soft spot for Cage ones Gummy Garage and just the way ships were put together in that game in general. As barebones as the routes themselves might have been, the pieces and blocks I used felt like they mattered more than what I put on my ship in the sequels. Adding things like a shield or haste gummy or even just some additional cannons was really felt when flying the routes, whereas those types of additions felt either less known noticeable or less important in the other games. In 2 especially, you're just constantly given new gummy blueprints and they're all presented to you before the start of each mission, which I definitely appreciate for a variety and ease of access purposes, but I'd always just pick whatever the cursor was hovering over and continue on to the route. You can very easily get through all the games without changing from the base kingdom model, but I always had slightly more interest in meddling with the vanilla structure in KH1. But... what about... I guess I'd also be remiss to not at least mention how the other two major games in the series handle world travel, namely Dream Drop's dive segments and Birth by Sleep's Nobel Prize winning method of doing absolutely nothing. I mean, make no mistake, let the record show that I have zero complaints with how Birth by Sleep chooses to entirely forego gummy travel. It does absolutely nothing in the way of world building or imparting that feeling of traveling, but at least it doesn't pretend to either. It's like impossible to grade because it didn't attempt the assignment, and that's kind of fine in my book. It seems like it definitely could have too, by filling out the game with sections like Ven's pre-deep space segment, and it mercifully chose not to. Maybe Keyblade gliders just move at light speed, unless you're stopping down to race preteen ducks or fight big jellyfish fuckers. As for Dream Drop, we've got the secret fourth D of the game, Diving. And I have to say, for a game that I usually give a harder time than the others, these segments are surprisingly pleasant. Again, nothing I'm ever getting the itch to specifically play, but they're visually nice, pretty unintrusive, and don't take up a ton of time. In fact, if you mash the dash button like I do, these are rarely much longer than a minute, which is honestly ideal. They also took care to theme each and every dive segment to make each one feel distinct and connected to its respective world. And the dives are engaging enough, like you'll probably just be doing the aforementioned dash mash and not make use of the other moves, but at least you've got to maneuver around obstacles and have some semblance of timing in certain spots. Contextually, I hate all of it because I have no idea why any of it is happening. I guess you can hand wave it away by pointing out that Sora and Riku are sleeping, so like, it doesn't really matter, but I don't know. Why are we entering worlds this way, and from where are we starting off when the dive begins? You're just on the most basic form of a world map that the series has seen, and then you're plunging into a world. Maybe some memento or boring Yen Sid speech explains what and why this is, but if so, I've clearly forgotten. So all in all, big plus for being short and thematic, but big minus for making like no effort in the way of story and gameplay integration. And just like with flying spaceships or free-falling through an Oniric void, we have to bring this thing in for a landing. As I mentioned at the onset of this video, the purpose of the project here was to highlight what I viewed as similarities or parallels between each game's gummy segments and core gameplay, as well as discuss the why and how of gummy travel from both a gameplay and story-related perspective. As for final takeaways, I think each iteration at least serves as a good way to break up the traditional gameplay and offer some diversity in content, but that doesn't necessarily change the fact that I never truly want to play any of them. I think that's just how I've always felt about vehicle sections in games that are not explicitly about piloting vehicles. I like Mario Kart because the whole point is to drive a go-kart. But even in my favorite games of all time, whether it's Pac-Man World or Spyro 3, if I spend the entire game on foot collecting stuff and fighting bad guys and then get plopped into a go-kart or tank hovercraft, I find myself anywhere from disinterested to full-on annoyed, and the same can be said of the Kingdom Hearts gummy segments. Maybe it's because in most cases there probably wasn't as much time spent on perfecting the vehicle-based gameplay when compared to the core gameplay, or maybe the core gameplay is just so good I'm always going to feel a bit annoyed when it's interrupted. Maybe it's a bit of both. But that leads me to my parting question. 
Heading into the next arc of the series, and what may someday eventually be Kingdom Hearts 4, do you want and does the series need another interpretation of space travel? Has the series outgrown the need for it, or is having it around still crucial for helping the universe of the games feel grounded and contiguous, and supplying breaks in the traditional gameplay? Because, to be honest, walking away from this project, it's an answer I'm still unsure of myself. Even in spite of my complaining, I have to admit that I think these segments have ultimately done more good than harm, but maybe I ultimately find myself respecting these efforts more than actually enjoying them. But I'd love to know what you think. Hey folks, there's that big old gummy ship video that you were all asking for. I don't know. I had fun with that one, actually, uh, despite what is probably, um, you know, perceived as less interesting subject material. I had a lot of fun with that script. Um, just was a nice, you know, shorter little project there. Um, so hope you enjoyed it. Leave a like if you did, especially for a video like this that probably less people are going to click on. As always, check out my Twitter, Discord, Twitch, and Patreon. Patreon's the big one. Helps me keep this whole operation afloat. Let me do this full time. I love making this stuff. I'm going to make it so long as I am financially able to do so. All right, that's all for today. I will kick it to the outro music by Nora Rosa, my patrons, and some fan art, including uh, a piece I had commissioned by Punkit Boy on Twitter of me and my dad from the uh, KH1 video for Father's Day. So I hope you enjoyed that one especially. Take it easy. Bye.